uh, Jeremiah chapter 33. Jeremiah chapter 33 is where we're at today, <clears throat> talking about what is needed. What is needed most, even, I would say. And what is needed most in our day, I would say, is um, the need for hope. Today is the first Sunday of what we call Advent. Over the next few weeks uh, leading up to Christmas, we'll be talking about hope, joy, love, and peace, which is uh, what Christ brings. Uh, the term Advent, I mentioned a moment ago, just simply means arrival. But what we need most in our world today is, is simply hope. And when I say hope, I don't mean the hope like I hope something's going to happen or I, I, I hope this. I mean sure hope, concrete hope, hope that is based in something that's real, hope that's based in something that is sure. And that is the hope that we find in Christ. That's the hope that we find as we study the scriptures and look, even in the midst of chaotic times. And I want to read this text of scripture here in just a moment. But ultimately, I want to, and then I'm going to come back and give some background of when this text was written. Because I think it helps us to understand sometimes we look back at scripture and maybe we don't always put together the context of when some of these promises or these things were written, especially in the prophet Jeremiah. Because uh, in Jeremiah, uh, the words I'm about to read probably almost seem uncharacteristic. Because Jeremiah, you, you, if you've studied scripture much at all and know the Old Testament prophets, you know that Jeremiah was, was not a prophet of, of, of much good. Uh, his prophecies were mostly uh, pretty harsh and pretty uh, hard. As a matter of fact, Jesus, uh, the Lord, when he called Jeremiah to be a prophet, even told him that he was going to proclaim a message which the nation of Israel would not listen to. He was going to preach and they would just reject. And Jeremiah tried to quit. He tried to walk away, but he couldn't because the word of God was in him so much that he couldn't stop speaking it. Even in, though many times it was to their, it, it, what it appeared to be to their detriment. But really it was ultimately the Lord trying to draw his people back to himself. It was the Lord trying to help them to realize that the path you're walking, the way you're going is not what it should be. Not what it ought to be. And so, as I think about that today, I want to read this passage of Scripture, and then I want to share some background as we look at our greatest need, or what is needed, and that need that we have today, that need that our world needs today, is hope. We have that hope. We have that hope in Christ Jesus, but our world needs to hear it. And we need to be reminded of the hope that we have in Christ, because sometimes it's very easy, as we look at the things around us, to get distracted to get distraught, to get in despair, because what we see doesn't maybe line up with what we want to believe. But that's when we have to go back to the truth of the Word of God. So I want you to stand with me, if you would. We're just going to read three simple verses in Jeremiah uh, chapter, <clears throat> excuse me, chapter number 33, beginning over in verse number 14. Scripture says, Behold, days are coming declares the Lord, when I will fulfill the good word which I have spoken concerning the house of Israel and the house of Judah. In those days, in those days when those things are fulfilled, and at that time I will cause a righteous branch of David to spring forth, and he shall ex execute justice and righteousness on the earth. In those days Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will dwell in safety. And this is the name by which she will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. Father, thank you for your righteousness. Teach us your word today in Christ's name. Amen. You can be seated. Just so that you know uh, and you think, well, that sounds like a pretty positive passage. Well, it is. It is a very positive uh, little uh, prophecy or passage of scripture that Jeremiah brings out. But I want you to know what's happening. At the time in which this was written, uh, probably in the, in the mid or late 500s B.C., 587 or so B.C., Jeremiah is writing this prophecy to a nation that is in captivity. He's writing this to Israel who they, are, they have been, mo most of the, the young and the brightest, the strongest, have been carried away to Babylon to, to be indoctrinated, to be, to hopefully what Babylon and Nebuchadnezzar had, had, had wanted to do was to bring all of these young, bright, um, 
strong young people into their area. They wanted to completely teach them away from the God of Israel. They wanted to teach that out of them. Uh, they wanted to get rid of the God of Israel. They wanted to just eliminate him and teach them the ways of Babylon, the ways of the world, we would say, is what we would say today. They wanted to teach them their secular ways and the multiplicity and the plurality of gods and all these things. And forget about this one God, but let's, let's get on with what, what the world, what, what we believe. And let's, let's practice that out. They tore down the temple. Uh, they, they had overthrown the king. They took away the two most iconic and the most stabilizing factors that the nation of Israel had. Number one, they overthrew the king. You remember all the way back in Judges when the people of Israel, they wanted a king, they wanted a king, they wanted a king. God told them, you need no king, I am your king. But they said, we want a king, we want a king. And so the kingly, the kingship or the kingly line was started and and ultimately, he put King David in place, and he said that the, the, that the lineage of David would, not, uh, would, would never go away, ultimately pointed to the person of Christ, which we don't have time to get into today. But, so they gave him a king, so that, that made them feel stronger, than, as strong as the other nations, because now they had a leader, they had a king to look to. The other thing that God instituted way back with Moses in the, in the wilderness was he gave them the plan for the tabernacle, for the Holy of Holies, and then ultimately the temple which that temple, that tabernacle represented the presence of God with his people. So the two things that were the most vital to the nation of Israel, the most important iconic figures in their existence was the king and the temple. Both of those have been destroyed. Both of those have been overthrown. And here they are carried away. They're not even living in the land that God promised Abraham to give them that they had come into after the exodus out of Egypt. They lived there for several years. Of course, they had done their own thing. Now they've been carried away into captivity. Everything that they know, everything that they think, everything that they believe is in question. They don't know who they are. They don't know what's going to happen to them. They are in turmoil. Sound familiar? Sound familiar in, in our day in which we live? Sound familiar for us as a church? You know, going back just about 18 months ago, everything changed. You know, theirs was a, theirs was a kingdom that came in and, and overthrew them. Ours was a pandemic that shifted how we do things. It shifted everything in our culture, whether you like it or don't like it, agree with it or disagree with it, really is a moot point. What matters is it changed. It transformed everything. It, not only that, but even going back before that, we've seen the, the, the violence of hatred and division over political structures, over political figures, over um, colors of skin, over all kinds of different things. We've seen division and all those kinds of things. We didn't get overthrown by an outside kingdom. We're being overturned by inside ideology. We're being overturned by... Uh, aligning ourselves with this group or that group instead of aligning ourselves with the Word of God and the Scriptures. And so today, we need hope. You see, these words that Jeremiah spoke were profound. They were a profound message of hope during bleak times, during times where there was uncertainty, where, during times where they didn't exactly know where to turn. But there was a message of hope. You know, the, these four chapters right here in the kind of in the middle of Jeremiah, chapters 30 through 33, are really kind of a, a pause button. Because most of Jeremiah's prophecy was said was, was not very positive. It was about destruction. It was about uh, discipline. It was about chastisement because they had walked away from the things of God. It was about a father disciplining those he loves because he cares for them. But here in this these, these four verses, this little interlude, we have four chapters that offer hope to a people in catastrophe. Where does that hope come from? That hope comes not from anything that they're going to do. It comes from what God is going to do. Can I tell you today, if we're going to find hope in the church in America, if we're going to find hope in a world, it's not going to come from anything we do. It's going to come from what he does. It's going to come from what he's already 
done. It's going to come by what we celebrate during this Advent season. It came 2,000 years ago in the form of a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and laying in a manger in Bethlehem. That hope came in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. And if we're going to have hope in the society in which we live in, if we're going to have hope as a church, that hope comes from him. It doesn't come from us. It doesn't come from our intellect. It doesn't come from our offerings. It doesn't come from our budgets. It comes from Jesus Christ. This hope is simply a hope. Is, or we add, You may ask the question, is, is, this, is this hope simply a hope for a bygone era, for a people no longer living. No, there are multiple layers to this hope. And it's most immediate, the words of these four chapters and these verses we just read are words of hope to the people of Judah that one day their enemies would perish. One day they will return to the promised land. Chapter 32 even describes a more grounded hope that God will give Israel prosperity and economic growth. The ultimate aim of this, though, is that all Israel would be restored to God, Jeremiah 31.1. Matter of fact, it proclaims the time is coming and Israel, uh, the time is coming, declares the Lord, Jeremiah 31.31, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. The following verses show that this restoration of God's people will restore God's people in a way that surpasses the original covenant. He talks about that as he looks at these verses. He says, behold, verse 14 of 33, the days are coming. Declares who? Not declares Jeremiah. Not declares some other prophet or preacher. Declares the Lord. The days are coming when I will fulfill the good word which I have spoken concerning the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Now, you may be saying right now, Mark, what does that matter? That's already happened. What is, what, is, what is my statement always? Many of you have been here for a while. Say, the best testament and testimony to what God will do in the future is what, God, what God is what God has done in the past. The best testimony to what God will do in the future is what God has done in the past. God made a promise to Israel. He said, I will restore you. He did. Their tem- remember, their temple's torn down. Their king is gone. What happened? Ultimately, they came back from Babylon stronger. Babylon actually paid for the rebuilding of the temple. He paid for the rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem. They paid for everything even after they came back. God restored them. Why? Because he made a promise. And you know that God's made a promise to us? In the Gospel of John, chapter 14 says he's going away to prepare a place for us. That one day he will come again and receive us to himself. That where he is there we can be also. He's made a promise to us that the gates of hell would not prevail against his people. Against his church. And ladies and gentlemen, I don't care what it looks like in society today. I don't care what it looks like in the media today. I don't care what it looks like in politics today. I believe Jesus. I believe the word of God over anything else that may be taught, said, or done. And I'm going to stand on that word. I'm going to stand on his word. Why? Because I know he's faithful. Because I know his promises are true. And I know he's powerful enough and faithful enough to accomplish the promises that he made to me. That's my hope. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. The word of the Lord, the days are coming when I will fulfill the good word which I have spoken concerning the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Do you know that we need that word to be fulfilled? Because if he didn't fulfill that word to Israel, he couldn't have fulfilled that word to us. Because going all the way back to Genesis chapter 3, we know that that promise of that righteous seed, that seed of the woman... That promise to Abraham where he said, through your son, all the world will be blessed. Through the promises to Jacob. Through the promises to the other patriarchs of Old Testament and the Israelites. Through all those promises, through the Davidic line, it came about that the person of Jesus Christ, God himself, entered the world to take away my sin and provide something for me that I couldn't do for myself. That's the hope of Christmas. The hope of Christmas, the the thing that is needed the most is the hope of the Lord Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, if you go on into verse 15, it says, In those days, speaking later on, many, many... Now, obviously, he, he fulfilled that prophecy. And I love this about Old Testament prophecies. Most of the time, even Messianic prophecies or prophecies about Jesus are fulfilled twice. 
They're fulfilled initially to the nation of Israel or the people who prom- prom- made the promise or the prophecy to. And then later they're fulfilled in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. He fulfilled this prophecy by restoring Israel to their former glory, by, by restoring them to their land, by restoring the temple. Now, ultimately, we know that the temple was torn down finally in A.D. 70 after Jesus Christ. It hasn't been rebuilt since. won't be rebuilt until, uh, the end, until we, we get into the, the end times of Revelation. But right now, we're standing at that point, but he says this, in those days, in those days when I fulfill this prophecy, when I fulfill this promise, and at that time... He says, I will cause a righteous branch of David to spring forth. You see, this is the righteous branch. Who is the righteous branch? The righteous branch is Jesus. You see, David was the king. David was where the the lineage, the family tree, we'll call it. And how that there could always be a king in the lineage of David sitting on the throne was to fulfill that through the person and work of Christ. You see, there's not a Davidic line anymore. There's not a Davidic king there in Israel, but that Davidic kingdom is forever retained through the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is a passage. This is a prophecy about Jesus entering, the Messiah coming. Everything about this talks about Jesus fulfilling both not only the Davidic monarchy as king, but the priestly work of the Levites all being fulfilled in the person and the work of one person. God and king were two primary identifiers, we mentioned, of the Israelite culture. So to them, for this to be restored was a profound message of hope. Think about it. In the midst of their trouble, in the midst of their trial, in the midst of their struggle, Jesus, God speaks to them through the prophet Jeremiah and says, hey, I'm going to restore it. Do you know that the Lord is speaking a word to us today? The Lord has spoken a word. He's, he's spoken a word a long time ago that said, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do what I said I would do. I'm going to finish what I said I would do. Yesterday, we were over at the Lee Farm. Yesterday morning, about 8 o'clock, about 65 men gathered to carry on a tradition, to carry on a tradition, to carry on a vision that Gordon had wanted to start and Grayson wants to continue. And as we were there, we were sharing the Word of God, and the Word of God was shared. Mike Volkman shared a word that the Lord had given to him out of Matthew and Luke. And we talked about the aspect of, uh, of John the Baptist. You remember when John the Baptist was in, uh, I had to give Mike credit because he's here. He might call me out if I didn't. But uh, we, we were talking about this yesterday. And uh, what, what a profound word though. You remember when John the Baptist was in prison? You, here's John. John's the one who preached Jesus. He, I mean, he's the one who, who leaped in his mother's womb when Elizabeth, who was carrying Jesus, entered the room. I mean, this is a guy who's been filled with the Holy Spirit since, his, since being in his mother's womb. He preaches Jesus. He baptizes Jesus. He sees the Spirit descend on Jesus. This is a guy who saw everything there, but yet in a moment of trial, of difficulty, he's in prison. He's about to be beheaded. He's struggling. And he sends two of his disciples to Jesus, and he says, and he tells them to ask him a question. Are you the one, or should we look for another? John the Baptist had a question. He had a struggle. And he said, listen, are you the Messiah? Are you the one we're looking for? Or should we look for somebody else? You know what Jesus said? I I thought this this was just amazing. Jesus didn't even answer the disciples. He said, go back and tell them, tell him what you've seen and what you've heard. You know what he was doing? He was reaffirming John because he knew something. He knew something about John. He knew that John knew the Word. He knew that John knew the Old Testament Scriptures of that day. That was the Word of their day. He knew John knew it. And he knew that John knew the testimonies about the Messiah. So he said, look, I'm not going to answer that question. What I'm going to tell you is I want you to go back and refer back to the Word, which will prove everything that I've said to be true. And when you go back to the Word, you'll know exactly who I am. Can I tell you something today? If you'll go back to the Word you'll know exactly who he is. If you go back to the Word, you'll have hope. If you look at the world, you'll have despair. If you look at the world, you'll have struggle. If you look at the world, you look at our country, you're going to have difficulty. But if you go to the Word, you'll remember that God told Jeremiah to tell Israel, which told us, 
that I'm going to raise up a righteous branch. I'm going to raise up one who's unlike anybody else, who's going to live life like nobody else, who's going to die death like nobody else, who's going to defy death like nobody else to show you exactly who he is. Ladies and gentlemen, what we need today is not a revival of the world. We need a revival of the word. We need a revival of the word in our churches. We need a revival of the word in our houses. We need a revival revival of the word in our personal lives. We need to quit reading romance novels and start reading the greatest romance novel, the word of God and how much he loved us. We need to stop watching Netflix and stop watching Hulu and stop watching everything else and start watching and reading the Word of God, letting it get inside of us so it can get in us and it can get out of us and get to a world that desperately needs to know about hope. That's what we need today. That was pretty weak. You know why? Because we just probably there we need to say, oh, me, when we need to say, amen. And I'm talking about me, too. We need the Word of God to carry us through. He says, I'm going to raise up a righteous man. What does the word of God say? I look around and I see chaos. I look around and I see stuff that, man, I, I never dreamed I'd see in my lifetime. Now, I'm going to tell you, I know, financially speaking in our country, we're nowhere close to what it was in the Great Depression. You know, we always think that oh, we're living in the worst times in American history. Get, come on, get over yourself a little bit. You're not living in the worst times ever. Man, we, we're still blessed. We're a blessed nation. I mean, I, yeah, things are different. I mean, we're all, we're all upset because we can't get all the right toys at Walmart. The shelves are a little bit empty right now. Yeah, there's worse things in the world. There's worse things in the world going on than what we're experiencing right now. There's worse things that have happened in the world. But you know what? God is faithful. But you know what? I don't read it here. Any, I made a lot of promises to the people of God. I don't read any promises to a specific nation except for the nation of Israel. And Tony Evans said recently at the South Carolina Baptist Convention, and I loved it, he said, we better be careful that we don't wrap our Christianity, Christianity so tight in an American flag that we forget who we really are. Some of y'all and some of me need to hear this. I'm more proud to be a Christian than I am an American. Being an American is not what defines me. Being a follower of Christ is what defines me. And who's in the White House or who's in the outhouse doesn't matter to me. What matters is who's in my life, who's guiding my life, and who's guarding my life. Because you know what? A president, a Congress will let me down, but Jesus Christ never will. And we better be careful that we don't get out there. Listen, there's another thing. Let me just go. Let me, let me, let me, can I rewind a second? We don't need to just get rid of Netflix and Hulu. We need to get rid of MSNBC and CNN and Fox and all of them. You know what we need to do? We need to get on our knees before God and ask him to change this nation. Because CNN and Fox and all of them, they ain't going to change it. But Jesus Christ can. And if we quit posting about politics, start posting about Jesus, we stop talking about who's in the White House or who's in this house and start talking about Jesus, we might make a difference in our country instead of just making people more mad. Well, that deserved an amen, but I appreciate it. I'll tell by your silence I'm plowing in the right field. Amen. Amen, Let me tell you something. It's time that we get back to where our hope comes from. And my hope is in the Lord. My hope is not in anybody else. My hope is not in a denomination. My hope is not in anything other than the Lord Jesus Christ. In Christ alone, I put my trust. He is my light, my strength, and my song. And if he's not, folks, you're trusting in the wrong thing. You see, we live in a time of already not yet. We live in a reality that I'm a citizen of heaven, but I'm not there yet. Do you know that you are eternal right now? This is going to be revolutionary for some of y'all. Do you know that when you accepted Christ, you were, you, Peter says it, take his word, not mine, you were taken out of this world and you were placed into heaven. At that moment, 
You are eternal right now. I'm dual citizen. I have dual citizenship. You know what that means? If I have dual citizenship in two countries, when I go to the border, I don't have to go through all the mess everybody else does. I just show my credentials, and I walk across the border. You know what's going to happen one day? One day Jesus is going to step out on a cloud, or he's going to call me home. I'm not going to have to go through all the mess everybody else does trying to beg my way through. I'm just going to say, I'm with Jesus. He's my credentials. And I get to walk right on through. Man, what a blessing. What a hope. What a reality. You know how miserable the last week would have been with no hope? Without the hope of Jesus, knowing that my friends and my family who know the Lord Jesus Christ, who are already there, that one day I'm just going to waltz right in. I'm going to go in. They're going to say, welcome home. Where you been? Let's get on with the party. Let's, I mean, this is time, folks. It's time to realize that our hope is not in anything in this world. It's in Him. But here's the problem, and it's just like Christmas. It's a waiting hope. Oh, do you remember when you were a kid? Some of you kids, you, can, you're, you are kids, so you can remember this. Do you remember when you were a kid, December 1st would hit, and it seemed like 14 years before December the 25th got there. It, I mean, oh, we agonized every day. How many more days is it? Now you're a parent, and January 1st hits, and December 25th is the next day. It's reality, isn't it? It's a waiting hope. We, we anticipate in hope. We wait. But we also remember that the Messiah came just like he said he would, just like Jeremiah prophesied he would. But we need to remember also there's a second coming, just like Revelation 21 promises he will. And while it hasn't happened yet, we can live like it already has because he's already come in my life. And he's changed me, and he wants to change you if he hasn't already. And he wants to give you a future and a hope that's greater and grander than anything that you could possibly imagine. But the waiting, boy, it's, it's difficult, isn't it? It's not fun. I, I told the first man, God, I don't pray for patience. You know why I don't pray for patience? Because the Bible says tribulation brings about patience. So I say, if God wants me to have it, give it to me, but I ain't asking for it because I don't want tribulation. But you know, waiting isn't fun. It's often painful, isn't it? Matter of fact, think about these. Waiting, waiting for the results from a lab test can be agonizing. Waiting in traffic. We wait in line at the Department of Motor Vehicles. We all have read that one, haven't we? We wait, in line at the, we wait for an apology that might never come. You see, waiting is a visible sign that we live in a fallen world and that not all is as it should be. For if everything were as desired, we wouldn't have to wait for it. But waiting also shapes us. In the waiting, if we're not careful, we can grow bitter. We can let resentments fester. We can become paralyzed with fear. We can use the waiting as an excuse to do nothing. But waiting is not passive. This text shows us that we can be a people who wait in hope. This deliverance didn't come for years down the road, but it came. Our hope is in the Lord who is faithful. God will restore his people. God brought the Messiah, Jesus, who was God in the flesh, and one day Jesus, this Messiah, will return again. So in the waiting, we are not passive, but rather we join with God in God's mission, working to more fully bring about his kingdom. And as we look around, we see many challenges. Just as the original hearers of these words saw in their day, the promised hope of this passage is not an empty hope. It's one that is connected to concrete reality. And you know, in our day, there's much about which we can despair. Churches have lost quite a lot since March of 2020. 
Most churches in the United States still have a fraction of the in-person attendance of before. And let me just pause there for a second as I close. I'm glad we have online. I'm glad that, that people can watch online, but I'm going to tell you something, folks. Until the church gets back together and we become gathered together to worship the King of Kings together, I'm glad we have the online version. I'm glad when we, people can't be here and there's good reasons they can't be. I'm glad we have that. But I'm going to tell you, the church is not a virtual church. The church is a gathered church. And it's the gathered church where you find power. It's the gathered church where you find support. It's the gathered church where you find comfort. It's the gathered church where you find peace. And it's time to get back to the house of God, worshiping the King of kings and Lord of lords together as a people of God for his glory. Because I need you. And we need each other. The church doesn't need us. We need the church. And it's time to come back. It changed us, though. Many people haven't come. Many of us have, have loved ones who have died. Ongoing economic uncertainty and political unrest. People seem to be more, more divided than any other time in recent history. Pastors and church leaders are contemplating quitting at record numbers. For some time, for some it feels that the 21st century church in the Western world is in an exile of sorts. However, just as there was a case in Jeremiah's day, God is still at work. The Messiah is still our source of hope and strength. And like the people of Judah, we are called to be a people who wait in hope. One day, Jesus will come again to make all things new. In the meantime, we look for where the Spirit of God is at work, and we join with God. In the waiting. Will you join with God in the waiting? Will you accept Him? Will you trust Him in everything? Let's pray. Father.